let us begin. We're learning about great teshuva, right? Teshuva gedoyla, or as we're as we call it in other places, we call it teshuva ilaa, which means elevated teshuva, the highest level of teshuva that is possible. The reason we're having this conversation is because we're in chapter seven. In chapter seven, the Alter Rebbe spoke about the possibility of a person taking an opportunity where they could have elevated themselves, and instead of elevating themselves, they allowed themselves to be dragged down into a world of bad decisions and therefore a world of, of impure behavior. So how do you get out? How do you get out of the hole? So the altar ever told us, well, the truth of the matter is, if a person engaged with something which is what we call klipas noiga, which basically means something which is kosher, but the person hasn't used it for a kosher purpose, well, then they can elevate themselves fairly easily. You've just got to realign, you've got to refocus yourself, and you've got to move in a different direction. But, however, if a person engages with something which is forbidden by the Torah, in that case they get engaged and involved in what is called Shalish Klippas Atameyos, absolute impurity, total toxic energy. How do you get out? We said you can't get out. It's Lo'ilam. It is forever. Because the things that are stuck in the world of impurity are stuck there forever. Or, we said, right, either Mashiach comes, and when Mashiach comes, Hashem removes all impurity from the world and all the negative energy, etc., or the person does teshuva gedoyla, a person does a tremendous degree of teshuva, and it's such an immense teshuva that it completely changes their reality. Okay, so that's what we started to learn about. We spoke about the possibility of teshuva that would relieve a person from consequences. We spoke about the possibility of teshuva that would allow a person to reduce a, an intentional misbehavior to become an unintentional misbehavior. Now we're talking about Teshuva Gedoyla, the ultimate kind of Teshuva, or as it is called Teshuva Ilah, the elevated level of Teshuva, where the purpose of that Teshuva is to take something and to totally transform it, take the negative and completely elevate it to become positive. And the question is, how exactly do we do that? So if you have the Tanya in front of you, then we are on page 30. Page 30 is using... Uh, somebody says I sound very bad. Is that a personal thing? <laughs> Is that a personal thing? Uh, it could be. It could be that it sounds bad because uh, the internet sometimes does that when it is low chaining. Then the internet is not as strong as it is supposed to be, even though we have a good connection. But sometimes the service provider does not have such a good connection, and then we're stuck. So we will do the best that we can do. We'll do the best that we can do. Okay, if you have the Tanya, it is on page 30. I'm going to stick it up on the screen as well. And um, I'm going to go back a little bit. I'm going to go back to where he introduced the idea of this tremendous Teshuvah that can completely transform and elevate our situation, our circumstances. And we're going to, because we haven't fully unpacked it, so now we're going to fully unpack it. Okay, that's what, that's what we're going to be doing now. So if you're looking at the Tanya, it's on the screen, it's easier because it's going to be the, uh, the second last line. But if you're looking in the, in the Tanya itself, it must be about, what, three, six, nine, ten lines from the top of the page. And the first word on the line is Shiyaase. Shiyaase Teshuva Gadoila. That person will do Teshuva Gadoila, will do great Teshuva. What is great Teshuva? Teshuva Gadoila, Kol Kach. If a person does Teshuva that is so extreme and so incredible, to the extent that behavior that a person had done deliberately, knowledge, but knowingly, knowing that this is against what Hashem wants, and I'm still going to do it anyway. So it's possible for a person to do such a powerful teshuva that turns those actions from being these uh, blights on a person's on a person's history, like, you know, my gosh, you did these terrible things, and it could become, Zochios could actually become credits. So imagine, imagine if you could do this with your bank. You could go to your bank manager and do Teshuva, <laughs> and as a result of the Teshuva, not only would they cancel your debt, but every, uh, every amount of debt that you're in, they would turn into a credit of your, on your account. Hashem is more forgiving than the bank Correct. Exactly. Not only is Hashem more forgiving than the bank manager, much more importantly, Hashem is not bound by circumstance. 
So if I'm a bank manager, at the end of the day, either you have money in your account or you don't have money in your account, I'm bound by that reality. Hashem is not bound by the reality. Just because a person did something that dragged them down into a bad place does not limit Hashem. The person does not have to be stuck there. Hashem can give them the opportunity not only to rehabilitate, but to transform that negative to become positive. How? Shehi teshuva mi ahava. So the first major clue that we get to what this great transformational teshuva is, is the fact that it is teshuva me ahava, teshuva that is motivated by love. Okay, so right now that tells us that there are two possibilities of what motivates teshuva. There's the most common motivator, and then there's the more mature motivator. The most common motivator of teshuva is fear. Why do most people do teshuva? I'll tell you an interesting story, right? So, uh, once had an opportunity, not so long ago, to catch an individual who was employed by us, stealing, right? <laughs> so, I caught him red-handed. So, he panicked, completely panicked, right? So, that's, what's, that's like the classic teshuva that people have. The person's not afraid of having done something wrong. They're afraid of the fact that someone's going to catch them doing something wrong. And then there'll be a consequence. Now, in a very, as we discussed, in a very immature level, the consequence could be, oh my, I'm going to be punished. And in a much more mature way, the consequence could be, oh my, I'm losing a relationship because of this behavior. But either way, it is motivated by fear. The deeper, more advanced, more profound kind of teshuva that a person should look to achieve is teshuva mi'ahava. Teshuva that is motivated by love. Now we have to ask ourselves a question. Why would love drive teshuva? How does this work? And was understand, it makes complete sense logically that if a person is afraid of something, that will prompt them to say, I'm going to change. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do this. I'll do it differently next time. You have my word. I'll, I'll never... Makes sense. But how would love motivate a person to do Teshuvah? It doesn't sound right. If, if you have love, your relationship is not Teshuvah. Okay, I have to be careful how I say this because some married couples will tell you it's because you're in it, you love your spouse. That's why you're always doing Teshuvah. <laughs> Right? But we've got to understand how does love produce Teshuvah? It doesn't sound right. Teshuvah is repair work. Love sounds like the motivator for having it in a healthy place in the first place without having to do repair work. It doesn't, that, doesn't seem to add up. So in order to explain this, what we have to do is understand what love is. You know, in modern terms, actually not even in modern terms, probably since the Renaissance, more has been written, whether it be in novels, in poetry, in song, or in movies, about love, probably more than any other subject. And the funny thing is, most people still don't know what love is. And maybe that's the reason why there's, you know, it's got this mystique, and, and therefore, it becomes the content of so much of the artistic community because people don't know. It's like an elusive concept. What is love? But there's a, there's a whole profound insight into in the mechanics of love to understand what love is. And if we don't understand what love is, then it becomes really difficult for us to imagine that love could be associated with teshuva. And the truth is, it would become difficult for us to proper, properly experience love if you don't know what you're looking for. It's unlikely that you'll find it. So, my favorite example. The same person, in the span of five minutes or less, could make the following two statements and believe that they're both accurate. Statement number one, I love my children. Statement number two, I love soccer. 
How could you possibly use the same word to describe the emotional attachment that you have to your children as to describe a particular sport? Especially seeing as most of the people who say, I love soccer, what they actually mean to say is, I love sitting on my couch with a beer while there's soccer happening. <laughs> In other words, they're not saying, I love to be an active human being who's out there on the sports field playing soccer. I, mean, I love the entertainment that soccer gives me. So how is it possible that we could use the same descriptor for a deep emotional attachment to the most important people in our lives as we'll use for something absolutely superficial. Must be that we're not quite sure what love is. So because we live in a world where we think that love is all about either hearts and rosy colored glasses and everything's fantastic and the music's playing in the background, or we think that love is just about anything that I happen to be attracted to or enjoy, so that's why we don't understand how love can motivate to shiver. So let's ask ourselves a question, and it's an interesting question. We're going to come from a very interesting perspective. You may recall that in chapter 1, one of the things, and it was a complete detail, it, it wasn't a central part of the chapter, it was like a sidebar of the chapter. But one of the things that we said was that, and we were talking there in the context of the Nefesh Bahamis, the animal soul, but it's still valid right across the board, we said that the makeup of a person is very similar to the makeup of, of the world itself. The world is comprised of things that are composites of fire, air, water, and earth. And in the same way, the human being is composed of the temperaments of fire, air, water, and earth. And in chapter one, we describe how each of those manifests if it's not healthy. So let's ask ourselves this question. Love. Which of the four elements would we most closely associate with the temperament of love? Fire, air, water, or earth? Fire. fire. Why do you say fire? Passion. Passion. Right? Passion. So I'll tell you something interesting. In the language of Hasidus, we're taught that there is love like fire and love like water. In other words, there are different types of love that a human experiences. So you immediately went to the word passion because passion is a very fiery word, which is accurate. So passion would describe love like fire. So in order to understand the difference between love like fire and love like water, let's try this. If two people are siblings. Is their love like fire or like water? In other words, the love of siblings, is it passion? Is, is, there, is it a passionate love? It's not a passionate love. The love of siblings is just like a, in a sense, like a calming, tranquil kind of love. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, obviously, you do have siblings that tear each other to pieces growing up. And that's exactly the point. That is exactly the point. When do siblings rip each other apart? When they're kids. Because there's an immaturity in their relationship and there's an immaturity in their, in their personality. So, when they're kids, that's where they beat each other to a pulp. But when siblings grow older, you can have siblings who live in different parts of the world and it doesn't weaken their love for each other. It's considered love like water, love that is very consistent and very serene. Like imagine just the scene of like a beautiful lake. It's very tranquil. When you're in that environment, you feel that it calms you. That's the kind of love that is called love like water. And in spiritual terms, somebody who's a very advanced person spiritually, what we would call a tzaddik, their love of Hashem will typically be love like water. It's constant. It's reliable. They'll always love Hashem. Just like the immediate family always loves each other. I'm not talking about where there's some crazy kind of breakdown and there's an unhealthy relationship. A typical relationship, there's an awe. Oh, it's, it's always there. It's consistent. You know this is your family. 
who was it that said, I can't remember, one of the uh, famous English writers. He said, home is the place that when you come there, they have to let you in. <laughs> so in other words, that's, that's love like water. It means it's, it's just it doesn't, need, it doesn't need to be created. It doesn't need to be, of course, it has to be protected. You always have to protect love because water can dry up. But it's, it's got this calming, serene, placid nature to it. That's not passion. Passion is fiery. Passion is excitable. Passion is unpredictable. Right? Somebody asked a really interesting question. Would the highest kind of love be a combination of fire and water? And, and possibly it would be. But let's leave that thought for now. But it's an interesting point. So what's fire? Fire, it, you know what fire can do? Fire can warm an environment that is cold. Fire can generate with the energy produced by the fire, can cause things to work. Like the classic steam engine, right? Fire can illuminate a dark place. In other words, fire is not tranquil. Fire doesn't reinforce and, re and, and ensure what already exists. Fire changes things. When you stick something into fire, it's going to cook, it's going to melt, it's going to evaporate. It's going to change fundamentally. Put something into water, it will become soggy. It will discolor, it will, maybe it will bloat. But it's not going to change form from solid to liquid, from liquid to gas. Fire is dramatic and fire is dangerous. If you don't know what you're doing around fire, all kinds of things can go wrong. Fire love needs fuel. Water doesn't need fuel. You take water, you collect it in a swimming pool. Okay, you've got to keep it clean. But it doesn't need fuel. It doesn't need something inside the water in order for the water to continue existing. Fire needs fuel. If there's nothing to burn, it doesn't burn. If it's not given oxygen, it cannot live. So which relationship is fire love? Family relationships are, in the, in the most part, Water love. Marriage is fire love. What does it mean is fire love? You, it's unpredictable. You don't know. It's, it's, it's dynamic. It's alive. The same person who you could have this passionate attraction to one day could be the same person you want to throttle the next day. Yes, I know. It could happen to your kids also <laughs> at, at certain ages. You remember, uh, you know who I'm talking about when he gave that f golden anniversary speech here at all. And he said, in 50 years of marriage, they never once contemplated divorce. He says, but murder many times. <laughs> because it's fire. And in order for the fire to continue to burn, there has to be fuel. You don't have to keep investing in the relationship with a sibling in order for them to be your sibling. They're always your sibling. Of course you can invest in how much you appreciate the love and bond between you. But if you don't invest in it, it's not going to go away. It's just going to become water that's polluted. But it will still be there. So you leave your swimming pool and you don't put in any chemicals. What's going to happen? The water will remain water, but it will become disgusting. If you don't feed fire, the fire goes out. The love of marriage, if you don't feed it, dies. So it's fire love. Here's the other interesting thing about it. Siblings, it's natural for siblings or parents and children to love each other. It's natural. It's not natural for spouses to love each other. <laughs> well, think about it. Here's a person 
who grew up in a different environment, in a different family, different sets of values, had a different experience of life for whatever amount of years it was until you met for the first time. There's nothing natural about the fact that you get together and you decide now you're going to become the most important person in my life and we're going to build a family together and the whole legacy of generations to come is going to be built on this. It's not natural. That's why marriage, you know, you know what they say, if you're a public speaker, I don't know how it is in other places, but certainly on the Jewish circuit, there are two topics that will always draw a crowd. The one topic is, why do bad things happen to good people? The other topic is relationships. The expert speakers will tell you they're both the same topic. <laughs> Marriage, why do bad things happen to good people? <laughs> right? So, <clears throat> why, why do people always come flocking? Why are people always reading books, watching the experts on TV, listening to podcasts, going for therapy? Why? Because marriage is not a natural situation. It's not a natural situation. You've got to feed that fire all the time. But what does the Torah say about marriage? All the way back at the beginning of creation, the Torah tells us, Al Kain Yazov Dovak Therefore, a man will, uh, will leave his father and his mother and cleave to his wife, and they'll become a single entity. That means to say, the power of the fiery love is that it can remodel who you are, just as in the same way as fire can turn solid into liquid and liquid into gas. So the fire of marriage remodels who the person is, totally recenters their world. So you've got somebody who was looked after by their parents for 20, 30 years of their life, now suddenly moves all together and says, listen, stay out of my life. I've got somebody else. And it is possible to have a love in marriage that is more deep and intense than the love you have in your own immediate family. Why? Because love of fire is a love that says we need to connect. Love of water says we are fortunate that we are connected. Love that like fire says we need to connect. There's something very, very meaningful and valuable in our, in our relationship, in our connection. So therefore, we need to connect. The room is cold, we need fire. The room is dark, we need fire. We need this. It's not something to take for granted. When a person wakes up one day and realizes that they have made X amount of really bad spiritual decisions in their life, and as a result of that, they have distanced themselves from Hashem, they're not going to have a response to that, which is a water love. But it's not going to turn around and say, ah, da, 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 and therefore my spirituality is cold and dark, but it's okay. I'll go sit by the pool. <laughs> there's going to be an intensity. There's going to be an urgency. There's going to be a love that says we need this relationship. That's what I'm realizing. I'm realizing I need this relationship. Love is attraction. Fiery love is passionate attraction. The irony is that sometimes we only realize the need for a relationship when we've almost lost that relationship. Fiery love. When a person realizes, you know, it's interesting, if you have a look in the Gemara, so the order in which the tractates of the Gemara are presented is first there's the tractate that discusses divorce and only after that the tractate that discusses marriage, which is strange. Surely it should be the other way around. So the simple reason for that is because that's how the Torah presents it in the original verses. First it talks about the possibility of divorce and then it talks about the possibility of marriage. But that doesn't answer the question. It's still a question. Why Tucker? You know what the answer is? Or possibly one of the answers? Because unless a person understands that there's the possibility of a divorce, they won't realize the urgency are fueling the fire of the marriage. If you think that this is a guarantee, you don't have to invest so much. The tzaddik who has the love like water doesn't have that sense of urgency in his connection to God that other people might have. He's never entertained the possibility of divorce. He can't divorce because he's feeling like a family member. 
Here we're learning about somebody who has tshuva mi ahavo. Teshuvah that is motivated by love. Not motivated by love, like I love God, therefore I'm going to do Teshuvah. But Teshuvah that says, I need to love God. And therefore I really better do Teshuvah in a very meaningful, profound way. So let's read further. So this is Teshuvah mi ahava mi umko deliba. This is a Teshuvah that is driven by love that comes from the deepest dimensions of the person's heart. Which is described, it's going to use a few descriptors over here, Be'ahav or Rabba. That's where a person has tremendous love. The word Ahav or Rabba, the expression Ahav or Rabba, if you, if you daven with an Ashkenazi Siddur, then that's the, the paragraph before the Shema. In the Hasidic Siddur, in the Chabad Siddur, we use the expression Ahavas Oilam. And there are many places in Hasidus that describe what the difference is between these two kinds of love. That Ahav Asoylam is a love that, that exists within the framework of the world. Ahav Arabo is such an intense love, it breaks the framework of the world. So that's, that's what we're describing over here. We're talking about somebody who has so much love of Hashem that it's considered Ahav Arabo. It doesn't fit in the, the dimensions. It doesn't fit in the rules of the world. This is somebody who has such an intense love for Hashem. It's an unstoppable love. Vachasheka, which has tremendous passion associated with it. Venefesh shokeka, and a yearning soul, the dov koboyusporech, that is yearning for what? That is passionate for what? To connect. Now, the next couple of lines that he gives us will talk to the heart of what's so unique about this love. Vetsom o nafshoi la Hashem. When a person has this intense love for Hashem, their soul feels thirsty for Hashem. Like a person who would be in a, in a land that is tiring, exhausting, and desolate. So now imagine for a second a person who's in a desert. You don't even have to be that radical. You don't even have to think about somebody who's in a desert. Have you ever been really thirsty? It is one of the most compelling human experiences. That's so you'll often speak to people. I mean, I know that uh, when, when your kippah comes, everybody gets into their whole psycho uh, thing, you know. Oh my gosh, what are we going to do? How are you going to survive? You know, we're going to be fasting for 25 and a bit hours. And everybody starts saying, you've got to try this and you've got to take this medication before. You must eat watermelon. You must take a spoonful of honey. And everybody's got their eights about what you've got to do. That's before the fast begins on your kippah. What happens during the fast? So you hear everybody saying, ah, I'm fine. I, if I could just drink something, I'd be fine. I'm hungry, but it's okay. I can handle being hungry. But if I could just drink something, I'd be fine. If you are in an environment that is really, really hot and dry, thirst becomes such a powerful drive. So we're going to compare the neshama of a person who recognizes that they've done all kinds of things which are against what Hashem wants to the state a person might be in if they were, if they were alone in the desert. That's how strong the yearning is. Why is it so strong? The reason that the person has such a compelling, passionate love towards Hashem, such a thirst for Hashem is because the person suddenly realizes that they're in a desert. They're in the realm of those things which, to borrow the term we used in the previous chapter, they're from the other side. There's the side of holiness, and this is Sitra Achra, the other side that is unholy. And they are as far as you could ever get from Hashem. I hope I don't bring up any childhood traumas for anybody with this example. But have you ever seen the kid who gets lost in the supermarket? Have you ever watched the kid who gets lost in the supermarket? Or worse, the kid who gets lost in the amusement park. You know, it's much bigger now. There's a big crowd. Have so you ever watch? So the child kind of, you know, is doing his thing. It's probably daydreaming anyway. Doesn't notice that his mother's walked off turns around and she's not there. You will watch the face of that child. They go from this momentary 
blankness, like what just happened, to complete terror in less than a second. And it's in that terrified state that that child will do the most ridiculous things. They'll start running and they'll start screaming and they'll, you know, they'll become hysterical and they, they'll do anything that they could possibly do to, to find their mother. And that's when you get crazy things happening. Kids running into the street or, God forbid, going with the wrong stranger or whatever the case is. That moment of realization, where a person realizes that they're in trouble, that's a very important and very defining moment. You know, I was once talking to somebody who was swimming out in the KZN coast and they were swimming and the next thing a bit of a riptide came, they didn't even realize. Swept them out. They didn't feel, they didn't, it wasn't like a dramatic thing, they didn't feel what it was. They were swimming, turn around <laughs> and suddenly realized how far they were from the beach. That moment when a person realizes how far they are, how off the mark they are, you know, that's, what, that's when the panic happens. And when a person is that far away from the beach, the panic is not helpful because they're just going to exhaust themselves. The, the distance that they've got to be able to swim and if they're swimming against backwash and currents and whatever the case is, they're, they're actually just going to tie themselves out without going anywhere. But it's such a desperate situation that it's, it's literally like somebody's ignited a fire in them. That's what we're talking about when we say Tsoma, that a person's soul thirsts from for Hashem. It's that moment, it's that moment of realization where the person says, you know what, I'm so far, how do I ever get back? That child in the supermarket thinks he's never going to see his mother again. That person who's been swept out thinks he's never going to make it back to shore. The person who's done an Avera and suddenly realizes, you know what, I just took my soul and I locked it into the world of Klippa, that person's going to say, how am I ever going to get There's a panic. How am I going to get back again? It becomes this desperate moment. Here's another example, because that still sounds like fear. What happens if there's a, God forbid, a couple who's, uh, they, haven't, they haven't been uh, in the best space in their marriage. A lot of tension, a lot of disagreement, not seeing eye to eye, whatever the case is. But neither of them is interested in, in leaving the marriage. They've just become, you know, they've become jaded, they've become dis, dis affected, they, they're not interested. And one day the one turns to the other and says, I'm leaving. I, suddenly there's, a, there's an urgency, there's a desperation. I'll do anything. I remember when I, I wasn't even married yet. So, you know, it's always funny when people who are married come to Bokrim for marital advice. It's like a bit of a strange thing, you know. Uh, not, a, not something I would recommend, incidentally. But I remember clearly, I was, I, I, literally, I was, a, I was young, I was a book, I knew nothing about relation, nothing about marriage. And there I am. And this guy, his wife said, Zehu, it's over, she's out. And I remember his desperation. I remember he was pacing up and down and saying, okay, this is what I'm going to do. And this is my strategy. And this is what, you know, to, to, to win her back. This is what we're talking about in here. Tzom olechon afshi, like the Pesach says, as we're about to read. Tzom olechon afshi, my soul thirsts for you, Hashem. Your soul doesn't thirst if you're living in an oasis. The tzaddik is living in the world of water. He has love of Hashem, which is like water. He never feels desperation, never feels urgency, so he never feels passion. But a person who's done something which they shouldn't have done, that's the person who feels passion. That's the person who feels urgency. That's the person who gets completely worked up with this incredible energy. I've got to get back to shore. I've got to get back to my family. So therefore, velozois tsom onafshoi. It's because of that realization that the individual's soul thirsts. Their soul thirsts for Hashem. Beyeser ois mitzimoin nafshois hatzadikim with a thirst that is exponentially greater than the thirst of a tzaddik. 
There was once a chassid of the Alter Rebbe, the author of the Tanya. And this chassid had a son who was a little bit of a rebel. Now, it might be difficult for us to imagine what it was like to be a rebel 200 odd years ago, right? What's a rebel today? <laughs> and what was a rebel in those days? So you know what a rebel was? In those days, the Cossacks were obviously the arch enemy of the Jewish people in Russia. And the Cossacks were horse groomers. If you wanted to rebel as a nice Jewish boy, that's what you did. You got involved in horses. That was like a statement. See, here's this Chosin and his son got involved with that crowd and he, you know, and he bought himself a horse. And this was his life. His life was the horse. And his father was literally going crazy. So the father goes to a few Chassidim and he says, listen, I need your help. I really would like to get my son to have an, 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 an opportunity to speak to the altar ever. There's no way he's going to agree to go. It's, he'll never agree to go. You've got to help me. We've got to come up with a plan. How do we get him to the altar ever? So this is my plan, he says. You guys are big, strong guys. Do me a favor. You go to the Alter Rebbe's town, Liozna, and wait there. I'm going to tell my son that I have an urgent message that's got to get to the Alter Rebbe. And because he's got a horse that's so fast, he's the only guy who can get it there quickly enough. So that will get him to ride into town to the Liozna. As soon as he rides into town, you guys ambush him. You take him, you deposit him in front of the Alter Rebbe. <laughs> and uh, hopefully the Alter Rebbe can talk some sense into him. Okay, so they put together the details of the plan. Tells his son, I've got this urgent message. It's got to get to Liozna. He takes the horse, but off he goes. First time in his life, his father's actually acknowledged the fact that there's a value to his horse. He's very excited. Off he goes. Anyhow, he arrives over there. The next thing, the Hasidim are waiting for him. They grab him. They schlep him. They plonk him down in front of the altar and they walk out. Now, as much of a rebel as this fellow was, he had enough respect to know that if you're already sitting in front of the Alter Rebbe, you don't leave. Yeah. So he's waiting, he's waiting, he's like bracing himself, it's coming, you know, the, the big lecture is coming, you're off the rails and you've got to get yourself back and uh, he's waiting. So the Alter Rebbe says to him, tell me something, I believe that you have a horse that is very, very fast. Is this accurate? He's really surprised. That's what the Alter Rebbe is interested in. So he says, yeah, it's true. In fact, I have such a fast horse that to get from my father's shtetl to Liozna took me X amount of time and it was, it's quicker than anybody else. So the Alter Rebbe says, that's amazing. It's amazing to have a horse that is so fast, that is so swift. It's unbelievable. He says, but are, are you not scared to ride such a horse? He says, scared? Why should I be scared to ride such a horse? So the Alter Rebbe says to him, why should you be scared? What happens if your horse goes off the path and it goes in the wrong direction? And because it's such a fast horse, before you know it, you're going to be who knows where, deep in the forest, stuck here. Oh, the, the boy thinks about it. He says, you know, I, I never considered this. It's a real problem. Maybe that's why the Alter Rebbe is considered such a great man, you know, because he can think of scenarios that nobody else could think of. So, he thinks and he thinks. And then he eventually he says to the Alter Rebbe, he says, the answer is simple. Now, it sounds a lot richer in Yiddish. He said, Asmen chaptzech, which means when you realize that you're in the wrong direction, you turn the horse around. And because it's such a fast horse, before you know it, you'll be back where you need to be. What's there to be afraid of? So the Alter Rebbe nodded. And the Alter Rebbe said, Yeah, Azmen Chapzech. Which means, that's true, but you have to realize that you're deep in the forest. You have to realize. You said, when you realize, you get back. You have to realize. And then the Alter Rebbe repeated again, Azmen Chapzech. And then he repeated a third time, Azmen Chapzech. And at that point, this young man, Chapzech, <laughs> and he realized where he was and what he had done with his life. 
And it's a very powerful illustration of what we're talking about over here. Because we live our lives riding on this nefesh abahames of ours, on this animal soul, which is very powerful and very fast when it decides to go down a particular path. It goes down that path quickly and with energy and with power. And very often it's the wrong path. And that's how a person lands up in all these clippers. Not because the person is bad, but because the horse that they're riding runs in that direction. But when a person realizes, oh my, I'm sitting here wallowing in spiritual mud far, far from home. Then the power and the energy that drives a person back home is more intense than the energy of any person who's never left home. That's Ava. That's Tshuva Mi Ava. That's this incredible, incredible teshuva that is totally transformational where a person realizes, I want to have that love. I want to be in that place. I want to have that connection. So one of the classic examples of this is a very well-known story in the Gemara about a man called Eloza ben Durdaya. And the story goes that he was somebody who got involved with every kind of illicit pleasure that, that the Torah forbids. And on one occasion, he had a reputation clearly, on one occasion, years down the line, he's with a, uh, a woman of the night and she says to him, you have no hope. There's no way you can ever do Teshuva. And it, it shook him. Can you imagine? <laughs> the rabbis didn't get through to him. But this woman says there's no hope for you. And the Gemara records that he went and he cried and he cried and he cried and he to, to return to Hashem and eventually he died during that experience. And the, the Gemara concludes that there was a heavenly voice that says, Rabbi Elazar ben Durdaya has a portion in the world to come. So he was given a title and he was, you know. Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, who was the greatest spiritual leader of the Jewish people at that time, the author of the Mishnah said, he started to cry when he heard the story. And he said, look at that, one, there are people who can acquire their world to come in one moment. What was he saying? The great tzaddikim, it's a gradual, consistent, beautiful growth, but it doesn't have the fire. The person who has to become a Baal Teshuvah, the person who has to fix their life, they have this fire, they have this ability to transform, like you break down the solid to become a liquid and the liquid to become a gas. You break down the, the Avera to become a credit. That's the value and power of fire-driven love and teshuva. And it's in reference to this tremendous teshuva, Omru, that the sages said, that's when it is possible that behavior that a person did intentionally against Hashem gets totally transformed to become credits. Because the only reason this person is experiencing fiery love is only because they were so far from home. So it turns out that being far from home is the catalyst and therefore is now considered positive. You remember, imagine what he's telling us. So here you've got a person who did the worst possible things. They completely un uh, undermined the neshama. The minute they chapzich, the minute they realize where they are, and that becomes the reason why they've got to get back home so urgently, the entire experience was now part of their growth. It is no longer a black mark on their record. It is no longer an impediment to their spiritual journey. It is now the propeller, the engine room, the cause of all of their success. And this is an attitude that I think people have to recognize when it comes to, you know, self-assessment and when it comes to introspection, you know, people get very down and very depressed. I did this and I got caught up and whatever. And how do I ever come back from it? And here the Alter Rebbe is saying, well, as soon as we realize that we are so off the mark and therefore have to work so hard, then that negative journey actually transforms into a positive journey. 